Let's start just from one consideration. The conventional model of life in modern biology is based on the concept that a living organism is made up of an ensemble of molecules kept together by chemical forces. In this uh, vision, molecules are basically independent one of the other. So, according to the thermodynamics, the flow of energy through a living organism should occur in form of heat. Because heat is the form of energy which is communicated molecule by molecule, whereas work is the energy transmitted through sizable ensembles of molecules, and appear as free energy. There is a fundamental uh, consideration in thermodynamics that shows that the conventional model is inconsistent, because, consider that, we, living organisms, are, exist at a temperature of 36, 37 centigrade that correspond to 310 Kelvin degrees, absolute degrees. According to the Carnot theorem, the yield of a, a, a thermal engine, like we are considering in the conventional model should not exceed delta t divided t, where delta t is the variation of temperature within the engine. In our case, the variation of temperature does not exceed 1, 2, maximum 3 degrees. So 1, 2, 3 divided 310 is less than 1%. So, the yield of uh, our body considered as a thermal engine should be less than 1%. So, a high inefficient engine. However, according to bioelectrochemistry, the yield of uh, the biochemical reaction occurring on the cell membrane, for instance, is in the order of 70%. What that means is that a gross violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Not at all. This implies only that energy is not flowing in our body as heat, but as free energy. That's it. And in order to, to flow as a free energy, our molecule needs not to be independent of each other, but they should perform in unison. They should Act, the basic unity should be a large aggregate of molecules. Is that possible? The answer of quantum field theory is yes. Why? Because, uh, according to the basics of uh, quantum physics, each physical object, either a particle or a field should fluctuate. So, fluctuate spontaneously without external supply of energy. In a sense, energy is provided by vacuum, but not by us. So, we should have this uh, fluctuation for free. And the problem is, as was uh, uh, told by Walter Merz as far back as in 1916, is possible to tune together this spontaneous fluctuation of different atoms in order to get a unified body, a body and a large ensemble of molecules performing as a whole. This is the problem that at the time Walter Merz was not yet uh, solved for the lack of conceptual uh, tools, but in the following decades, the progresses of quantum field theory allowed to solve this problem. And it is possible to prove the following theory. If uh, we take a large 
number of particles. Suppose charged particles, atoms are made up of charged components, nuclear and electrons. So particles able to couple with the electromagnetic field. Now, we know that it's impossible to have an absolute vanishing electromagnetic field just because of the quantum fluctuation. The field fluctuates always, so there is always some small field around, <laughs> and this has been proved in uh, experimental in 1947 by the American physicist Willisman, who got the Nobel Prize for that, that showed that the energy of the electrons orbiting around the proton in an hydrogen atom have energies which are slightly different from the energy calculated in the hypothesis of the total absence of an electromagnetic field, where the only present field was the Coulomb field between the proton and the electrons. There was a difference of energy of one part per million, which is a very tiny quantity, but it's not zero. And this small difference, namely one shift, was uh, accounted for by the theorist uh, Feynman, Schwinger, uh, Tomonaga, who got for the, this explanation also the Nobel Prize, uh, who showed that this small difference is justified just by the interaction of the very tiny uh, field produced by the fluctuation of the vacuum with the current of the electron orbiting around the proton. So, at that point, the quantum fluctuation, the electromagnetic quantum fluctuation of the vacuum are definitely proven. There is also the Casimir effect, other effect. And now, now we should consider what happens when a large number of uh, bodies of molecules able to couple with the electromagnetic field are put in the present orbit, they are always there, are in the quantum vacuum, and they interact with the fluctuation of the vacuum. What happens is the following. Under two conditions. First, that temperature is not so high. Temperature should be low a threshold. Otherwise, the thermal collision will destroy the effect of the waves. So first condition. Second condition, the density of the particle should exceed that threshold. So we need to have many particles in, a, in order to overcome many fluctuations. We need to have a large number of particles. When the, the density threshold is overcome, spontaneously the system transits from a state where all particles are independent and the, and the electromagnetic field is only the field of the small fluctuation to a different state where all the quantum fluctuation of the atoms tune together and the molecules are moving in phase between two configurations of their inner structure in phase with a, a, a large, in that case, a large electromagnetic field which is got just by the coherent sum of all the tiny fluctuation of the large number. This is the theorem, which is a rigorous theorem, absolutely orthodox. So in this sense, from a physical point of view, the heterodox vision is just a conventional vision. Our vision is absolutely orthodox. This theorem can be found in the text. <coughs> Unfortunately, quantum field theory is applied only to elementary particle physics like the Higgs boson recently discovered. In the non-particle physics, not that we know, is ignored. So, when this is, uh, is produced, we got a coherent system. Coherent means that all the components have a definite which is common to uh, all the system. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, distinguish the different state of matter in the following way. The gases are systems where all components are independent. So 
there is no correlation at all by the way the word gas was coined by a Dutch physicist who uh, contracted the word chaos. Gas was a chaotic ensemble of molecules. Liquids are systems where the coherence emerges among the electron clouds of molecules, whereas nuclei remain non-coherent. And solids are systems where nuclei do, nuclei do become coherent. So in this way, what liquid water is a liquid, so in liquid water, uh, uh, the electron cloud oscillating phase. But there are many possibilities, considering the fact that the water molecules are many excited levels. So according to the level which is involved in the coherent oscillation, we have different kinds of water. In her presentation of Tomella de Nino, next Friday, we describe how many kinds of water we can get. Uh, of course, when we have external fields, this external field adapt to the quantum fluctuation of vacuum and allow a modulation of the kind of coherence we are able to get. And in this way, we can uh, try to explain the amazing results got by Jerry Pollack and his collaborators about water near uh, hydrophile surfaces because the field produced, in, the, in that case it's an electric field, the electric field produced by the surface would modulate the coherence and allow a peculiar feature to the particular water. In our story, we are addressing first the problem of absolutely water that, as my friend Vladimir uh, pointed out correctly, is a theoretical water. But you know that uh, physics proceed through theoretical non-existing object, a sequence of theoretical objects that at the end converge on the nature of existing real system. For instance, uh, the physics of Newton and Galileo ignored the friction because it was a complication. So the theoretical bodies in classical physics are frictionless uh, bodies. In our case, in the first application of the theory of coherence to water, we studied an ensemble made up by water molecules only, without any other contaminant. And the only variable uh, that uh, was considered was temperature, nothing else. In this case, we were able to prove that the lowest energy state was a state emerging from the oscillation between the ground molecular state and then excited state at the 12 point something electron volt, which is just below the ionization pressure. So this coherent oscillation is peculiar. It is a result which applies only to water. It's non-existent in other liquids where the oscillation occurs between the ground state and an excited state where electrons are less bound but still bound. So in this case, in this other liquid, the oscillation doesn't produce any almost free electron. In the case of water, the coherent oscillation that occurs between the ground state of the molecule and the state at 12 point is an oscillation that produces one electron per molecule almost free. So, in this uh, uh, large aggregate, whose size is one tenth of a micron, uh, molecule move in unison and produce a pool, a reservoir of almost free electrons. So, in this sense, the oscillation occurs between a ground state where water is an insulator because all the electrons are tightly bound, and the metal state where uh, water becomes a semiconductor because there is one electron per molecule which has a very tiny binding residual binding energy. So it's 
very easy to get this electrons uh, free by a very gentle uh, perturbation. So, this result, by the way, uh, produces observable consequences because if we consider a, a system made up by coherent water and non coherent water, now we will see what is liquid and non coherent water, on the interface we have a jump of potential. So we have a pile because from one end we have almost free electrons, on the other end we have an insulator, so we have a, a, a jump of potential on the on the interface. We have calculated theoretically what is the order of magnitude, what is the uh, difference of potential, and we found that uh, depending on the excitation of the system, uh, we have a difference of potential between, included between 50 and 100 millivolt. This is just the order of magnitude of the membrane potential. So we would speculate that it's not the membrane which produces the membrane potential, but it's the membrane potential which <laughs> produces the membrane through this difference of potential. Okay. Now, how large is this, we target this region coherence domain? How large is this coherence domain? It's just the wavelengths of the electromagnetic mode responsible for the formation. The 12 electropod correspond to a wavelength of one tenth of a micron. So the, the, the size of this coherence domain is one tenth of a micron. Now, particular phenomenon of water. Since we have this reservoir of quasi free electrons within the coherence domain, the coherence domain of water is a unity still excitable because we can have coherent excited level of the coherence domain and coherence domain is able in turn to have its own oscillation. So repeating the same theorem as before, beyond the coherent aggregation of molecules within coherence domain, we can have also coherent aggregation of coherence domain into larger superdomains and so on and so on. So at last we get a hierarchy of a nested coherence domain. The smallest one, larger, larger, still larger and so on. By the way, introducing also the oscillation of the electric dipoles of molecules, we were able to many examples to prove the existence of a coherence among the coherence domain, whose size is just about, uh, we calculated the 450 microns, which is just in the order of the depth of the easy water. So, we encouraged by this result, we tried. Why we don't try to address the beautiful results of Jerry Power and try to include them, in spite of the objection of Jerry, <laughs> within the framework of uh, quantum field, is that possible? That won't be a major success for quantum field of course. Because facts are always true by definition. Theory could be true of this. Now, let's go ahead and eliminate the illusions. Now, just a minute, the role of temperature. Of course, the thermal collision among molecules counteract the attracting effect of coherence. So, we have a competition between the thermal movement and the electromagnetic attraction. As a result, we have that at each temperature a fixed certain number of molecules remain coherent and the other molecules are non coherent. So we have a coherent fraction and a non coherent fraction. This result is well known in physics applies to liquidium, for instance. In the Landau model of liquidium, it's a coherent fraction and a non coherent fraction. Unfortunately, in the uh, normal water, the a molecule performs continuous transition between the non-coherent phase and the 
non coerent phase. So, I'm not always the same molecule that are coherent. So, we have not uh, a landscape where there are fixed coherence uh, <coughs> and fixed non coherent regions. No. We have a continuous turmoil so that in the average, in bulk water, you cannot observe a permanent coherence because since experiment applied to localizable region, in a given region there is a continuous transition between coherence and non coherence. So in bulk water you can infer the existence of coherence from the thermodynamics. We are able to derive all the results of thermodynamics just by the theory of coherence. But if we are able to produce regions where the effect of the thermal collision is screened by some other effect, we are able to observe coherence for a long time. And this is occur just in the region close to hydrophile surfaces. Because in that case, the attraction between the surface and the water molecules compensate the, uh, the effect of thermal collision, protects molecules against the effect of thermal collision. So in this region, the coherent fraction becomes almost unity, and we can observe directly what is a coherent water. By the way, as Jerry has observed, the water close to, uh, to, uh, to a surface for a depth which can be reached just by this nested the coherences dynamics is different from the other water. It's different in the, in the right sense of, uh, of uh, the coherence. Because in a coherent region, you cannot touch one molecule without touching all the others, because they are all correlated. And uh, all the effect can be explained just by this correlation. Not only, but since this is a coherent region, and it is well known that the transition from coherence to according to the result of Isidore Isaac Rebbe occur in an oscillating way, the so-called Rebbe frequency observed in the laser. Uh, the, uh, in the center, you have a coherent region. This region becomes non-coherent. Uh, uh, non from non-coherence, transit again to coherence. This transition does not occur in a straight line, but occur by oscillation. And this oscillation can be calculated, and in the case of water, is 4.6 electron volts that correspond to a wavelength gives on 270 nanometers. So when you apply a radiation of 270 nanometers, you induce a transition in the water. What do you observe? But there is a result that uh, uh, just impressed which is not, not contained, not yet contained, in what I have said so far. A is the fact that it's a water is electrically charged, whereas water, as observed in nature, and as calculated in the theory developed so far, is neutral. So, what is the origin of this charge separation observed? But not only that, it's a peculiar charge separation because suppose that you have a surface negatively charged, for instance, like an alpha or like a DNA, which are a high density of surface and negative charge. What you observe is that the layer of water close to the surface is also negatively charged without any positive charge in between. Because you can just uh, remember recall the argument of uh, Feynman of like like slide, but in that case you should be the positive charge in between that attract from the two sides the negative charge. And this is not observed in the case. You have negative charge on one side, negative charge on the other side, and no other charge in between. The positive charge are mysteriously repelled on the opposite side of the layer, the layer looking to the bulk water. Should the 
see your face. Because if you reach out, it will just the opposite of work. So in this sense, it looks like the Coulomb law is just a reverse in the sense that like charge is attracted and uh, opposite charge is reverse. Contradicting the general law of Coulomb. How is that possible? And this is just one of the miracles of uh, the theory of Coulomb. Why? Because when an ensemble of particles is able, for some reason, to oscillate in phase, this phase oscillation produces a decrease of energy. So the system becomes stable on a lower level of energy. So according to the general law of physics, the, uh, uh, this state is preferred. The, the system just tends to, to, to realize this possibility. Now, in the, the case of water near the surface, when, and this is the case of the surface like Nafion or like biomolecules like DNA, we have almost three charges on the, on the molecular level. Almost three charges it means charge which are bound, of course, to the molecule matrix, but are able to make oscillations. So, this oscillation produces a collective plasma oscillation corresponding to the whole surface. It's possible to, have, to start coherence should the temperature be uh, low enough, not so high, but uh, suppose that uh, you have that this oscillation becomes coherent. Since coherence implies always a degrees of energy, we have a candidate to reach a still lower state and the free, the almost free electrons of the water. So the almost free electrons of the water are faced with the almost free electrons, free negative charges of the surface. And they could consider the possibility. Could we dance together? And in this way, by dancing together, produce a further increase <coughs> of energy. The answer is yes. Why? Because chemistry just prescribes what is the frequency of oscillation of the charge, sur the charge surface. But the frequency of oscillation of the free electron of the water is almost free because uh, the coherence domain of water can collect from the external noise, from the ambient noise, energy which is stored for a long way because the lack of friction implied by coherence gives a very long lifetime to the excited level. So they can adapt in time and produce whatever frequency you need, in particular the frequency of the surface, the hydrophile surface. So it's always possible for water to mimic the same frequency of the surface. By the way, is what uh, justifies the, the effect, the homeopathic effect on the grains of sugar. You have the surface of sugar and the water, the excited water in the solution, uh, in the aqueous solution, look, uh, in the interface with the ground, acquires just the same frequency. So the frequency of the body is transmitted, it becomes also the frequency. And uh, together with uh, Pierre Amado, which is present here, uh, we started also the droplets of water emerging from the waterfall in the Alps. And uh, Pierre was able to prove that these droplets are negatively charged, sometimes also positively charged, are electrically charged, and have the size just of our coherence domain. And these are quite stable in the sense that droplets are present for a very long distance from the waterfall, whereas smaller aggregates that are kept together by the convention of force decrease very rapidly when going far from the waterfall. <coughs> what that means that the convention of short wave forces produce very unstable aggregates, whereas coherence produce very stable. I think it's a good 
And this accounts why the so-called the unquote, diffusion rate is so high in a particular array because there is an accelerating force. And uh, the, uh, 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 this could be um, this gives rise also to other particular phenomena. I would say because of the existence of this uh, gradient force, a gradient force in physics could be proved is proportional to the gradient and is inversion proportional to the particle acted upon. So since electrons have a mass uh, 2,000 times lower, smaller than protons, in a molecule, uh, electrons are uh, uh, driven uh, the square root, the, the dependency on the square root of n, 50 times more strongly than nuclei. So molecules in this way get stretched and acquires a an additional electric dipole. For instance, this is a very interesting result. Carbon dioxide in the empty space should be an almost uh, uh, a, a, a noble gas because a carbon dioxide is a total symmetric molecules. Two electrons from one side, two electrons from the other side. So there are no hooks where other molecules could just uh, tie. And uh, in, in this sense, the carbon dioxide should have the same chemical reactivity as, uh, as nitrogen, as a noble gas. And it should be also very badly dissolved in water because there are no mechanisms. On the contrary, we know that uh, the solubility of carbon dioxide is very high, not only, but its chemical reactivity in water, not in the empty space, is very high. How is that possible? Because this gradient force produces a stretching of the memory that correspondingly loses its coherence, its symmetry, and acquires a, a strong electric dipole. And through this electric dipole, can interact with the electric dipole. So, water can produce the carbonic acid. Thank you.